Hey guys, so welcome to another video. Today I'm going to be explaining the basics of ECG, so it's going to be a kind of, uh, you know, retrospective. I know in the first video I explained some, like, normal advanced stuff. It was tachycardias, I think. But one of my friends told me, asked me to, to do some basics. So here we are, we're going to do it. And please, no comments about the shirt, just trying to represent. All right, let's get to it. So today we're going to be talking about just ECG <laughs> in very, very general, okay? How to start analyzing what's the normal for every wave and what differences can there be. So starting with ECG, don't forget me with Mac. All right, so uh, as we know, this is the heart. These are the atria, ventricles, left side, right side. And uh, here is the AV node. Then you have kind of the internodal pathways. And then you have the AV node, then bundle of His, two bundle branches. This is the right one and the left one. Okay, so the impulse usually initiates from the AV node, from the SA node, sorry. Okay, so it initiates from the SA node and then the two atria depolarize, giving us the P wave. Then at the AV node, there's a delay. Okay, so there's an AV delay. Then it, after this short delay, it gets conducted to the bundle of his, to the two bundle branches, and then the two ventricles depolarize. Now, the depolarization of ventricles, the QRS, goes as follows. There's a Q wave that comes from the left from the left to the right, okay? This is the Q wave because the left side is faster, the left bond branch depolarizes faster. Then you have an R wave, goes something like this. Okay, now this R wave represents the depolarization of the left ventricle, all these ones, if you add them together, and the right ventricle, a part of the right ventricle, okay? And then at the end, you have the S wave. The S comes after the R and opposite to it. So this is the S wave. Now there's a debate about what this S wave is. So some books say that the S wave is the depolarization of the right ventricle, okay? Some say the posterior basal, meaning if this is the apex of the heart, then this is the base, you know, it's like a triangle. So this is the base, so it's this, basically what's left of the ventricles, okay? The rest that hasn't depolarized yet during the R wave depolarizes through the S wave. Or some people say it's this one, okay? This area in here. Now here's the thing, the, okay, the ventricles, we know that the heart is situated not like this, but you know, the apex goes anteriorly, laterally, and you know, like sliding a bit, but this is not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the rotation of the heart. Instead of it being like this, it's rather rotated a bit like this, meaning the if this is my heart and it's, I'm telling you it's this way, then what you're facing is actually the left ventricle. So when they say the anterior wall, this is anteriorly, and this is what? The left ventricle. And then there's the lateral wall, which is also the left ventricle. And when they say the posterior wall, then what does it mean here, the posterior? It means it's the right ventricle. So when they say posterior, it's the same thing as saying the right ventricle. Okay, the same words. So these are the parts, uh, uh, these are the waves that we're gonna see. Let's 
like when we start analyzing how should we go so we usually start by rate rhythm and axis rate rhythm maybe I should make it here an axis okay now the rate we have two ways two different ways to calculate the rate it depends if the if the RR is regular or not so the rate in case it's regular then it means something like this right there we go this is a sample let's say this is R R R R R wave okay these distances are the same things okay same thing here then the way to calculate it is just to take this distance right here How can we, okay let's make it an uh, orange then this distance from here until here is the same right and it gets repeated this is the RR so you can just Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so you just calculate the distance between those two R's for example if I tell you that this is a minute and there are 60 beats per minute then how many what's the time between two beats if it's 60 per minute then it's just one second right so the difference between the R and the R is just one second one second okay but if you go the opposite way if I tell you that the distance is one second how many beats are there per minute? You're gonna tell me it's 60, right? If there are two, okay? If this, the distance between uh, the two RRs is, for example, two seconds, then you know that it's gonna be even slower, right? And this is gonna be 30 beats per minute. So anyway, this is one method, okay? Which is just to check the, which is to divide 300, by the number of big boxes or if you want something more accurate it's 1500 divided by the small boxes I like to call small square okay which is these two things are equal it's the same okay keep in mind that uh, every big box is 0 0.2 and it has five three four five okay it has four uh, five small ones each one is 0 0.04 second okay so this is one way but what if it's irregular okay if it's irregular then if I tell you this is a minute okay and you have R R R R R like something like this okay you cannot take the R R simply cannot just do this one or this one so you have to take a whole sample right let's say these are uh, what let's say this is 10 seconds so there's gonna be 10 the same like this ten, like one and two three four ten okay so one we have here one two three four five six okay six in 10 seconds then in 60 seconds how much are we get going to have then we multiply by six six by six that's 36 for example okay so you take a sample meaning any time or duration usually what we take is either 20 boxes or 15 let's do 15 if you take 15 big boxes okay and you calculate x let's say one two three we said six or let's make it x beats okay you have x beats then we want to know how many would these beats be okay in one minute right in one minute the one minute is actually as we know it's a 300 big boxes okay one minute slash 300 okay and then of course how many in a minute is the heart rate so to know this, how did we get from 15 here, from 15 until 300, we multiplied by a factor of 20. So here you just multiply by 20. Let's say you got six, six by 20, that's 120. 
So if this sample from here until here, okay, if this one was 15 boxes, so you take 15 boxes, you calculate one, two, three, four, five, six, okay, you just multiply by 20. If you always take 15, you always multiply by 20. If you always take 20, you multiply by 15. Yeah, so as we said, you just multiply by the number, whatever boxes you take, you multiply by a number to make it until 300, okay? For example, if you take 30 boxes, 30 boxes here as a sample, then you have to multiply by 10, okay? That's it. Now rhythm, aha, uh -huh. rhythm, rhythm. Here we come. The thing about the rhythm, it's a bit tricky, but I'll tell you the, the one that most of the books uh, depend on. So for rhythm, the first step that you check is whether it's regular or irregular, whether your R R's. So the first thing you check for is the R R, okay? And you're gonna get one of one of two. Either it's irregular or it's regular, okay? Now, if it's irregular, you just stop there. You say it's irregular and that's it. RRs are irregular. And you don't need to continue saying sinus or not sinus because the SA node must always give you, you know, uh, beats or impulses at the same interval. So if it's sinus, it has to be definitely regular RR. Okay? So if it's irregular, you just say irregular and that's it. Now, if it is regular, then you continue a step further asking the question, is it sinus or not sinus? Okay, now what are the conditions for it to be sinus here? The, there are three conditions for it to be sinus. First one, as we said, sinus means every QRS you get in the ventricles is coming from a normal sinus uh, and you know it comes sinus C, sinus Lee, <laughs> normally from the SA node. Meaning every QRS must have a P wave, must have a beat that comes from the SA node. So every P has or comes after it a QRS, and every QRS is preceded by a P wave. Why is that? Because if you have a P without a QRS, this means that the P wave got blocked here or here, wherever. So if there's a P without a QRS, it means that the P was blocked. Then it's not sinus. If you have a QRS without a P, then either this QRS came from the ventricle, somewhere here, here, okay, somewhere in the ventricle, and it started it, or it started something called junctional. We talked about it one time, junctional, in which still it does not initiate from the SA node, but rather from the atria, okay? So that's why there has to be a P before every QRS. Every QRS has a P. Second thing is the P morpho. The P wave morphology should be normal. When we say P morphology, we just mean the P wave, meaning its duration, amplitude, and morphology. Okay? We're going to talk about these three in the P wave when we talk about the P wave. But why is it important to have normal things, you know, normal parts or normal analysis? This is because the, uh, so we said the, the P wave morphology has to be normal because if it wouldn't be normal morphology, for example, if the P wave comes from here, an ectopic focus, okay, in the atria, then it wouldn't show the same morphology as the one that comes from the SA node. Okay, so a different P wave morphology or different duration, different amplitude, if there's a hypertrophy, all of these show or tell you that we cannot consider it sinus if this is changed. Okay, that's why we have to do it in three parts, duration, amplitude, and morphology. And the third one, we said everything before the QRS, everything before the QRS should be normal. So it did initiate from the SA node and it did continue depolarizing throughout the atria normally. And what's left 
it has to stop normally at the AV node. So the third one is the PR interval should also be normal, okay? And if it is normal, then it has stopped at the AV node at the right time. If this, for example, is uh, delayed, then this might mean we have a, a block here. A first degree block would delay the PR interval. Or if it's shortened, then it means something is bypassing the AV node delay. You know, just imagine here there's a, like a line. People are waiting here. They should wait for five minutes or no. Let's make it an hour. And then someone comes here. So this is what happens when there's an accessory pathway, the bundle of Kent and Wolf Parkinson White. But anyways, so if these three are there, if you check for all these three and they fit, then you can say it's sinus, okay? If one of these doesn't fit, then it's not sinus, and you just say that it's regular. You stop here. Regular, you don't have to say it's not sinus. Because if you say it's not sinus, you're going to be asked, why not? So you just say regular and that's it. Now, if it is sinus, we still have three further possibilities, okay? You may have sinus bradycardia or sinus tachycardia or, and here's the main one, normal sinus rhythm, okay? Be very, very, very careful when you use these three words together. When you say normal sinus rhythm, okay? What's the difference between this and this and this? Basically, it's just the heart rate, okay? Heart rate is somewhere from 60 to 100. All right? So that's the difference between these. So this is the fifth step. First, you have checked to, for, for the RR. Then you check for these three. These are four. And the fifth one you check for is the heart rate, which you already calculated in the beginning, the rate. Okay? So if, this, if the heart rate is normal, then you can say normal sinus rhythm. Okay? And that's it. Sinus of ready, it's a type of arrhythmia because the reasons of any arrhythmia are three as we know them. It can be altered automaticity, abnormal conduction, or triggered activity. The altered automaticity is these examples, sinus of ready and sinus tachy, meaning it does come from sinus, but the SA node is hurrying up or slowing down. Okay, so that's when you have the sinus ready and sinus tachycardia. All right, that's it about these. Let's do the access. Now for the access, the first two leads you check are one and AVF, okay? I'm gonna draw the, these ones here. So let's say you have a lead here, okay? Regardless of what is it called, and it just has zero degrees, for example. Then you have to draw a, per, a perpendicular line to it and then you can say that if the heart axis is here or here or here or here, wherever, even just a bit before this line, all of these are positive, positive, positive according to this lead. And here, it's negative. So how could you determine where it's positive from where it's positive from where it's negative? You drew the perpendicular line and this is the line that tells you which is going to be negative 90 here and positive 90 here, which will tell you that, okay, what's here, here goes with it, and what's here, that's against it, that's negative, okay? And now I can tell you that, oh, this is lead one, okay? So if lead one is positive, it means it should be here. And there's where you see some people just doing like this very fast, and this is lead one, and this is AVF, so, this region, okay, this one is all good, okay? This one is all bad. This one is all right axis deviation. And here, if it's here, this is left axis deviation. But here, so this is the negative 30 degrees. But if it's here, then this is also good. It's a normal axis, okay? And here it's all no man's axis, they call it. Or you can consider it a part of right axis deviation. It's fine. 
All right, so how do you determine? So if it's this, then this is really easy. It's going to be positive to lead one and positive to ABF. So positive and positive to these two leads. That's really easy, okay? Or the other case is, uh, let's make it here. If you have lead one is positive, is negative, then I'm going to draw it here real fast. We said like this, right? So one is positive. It means it's in here. This is one. Now make it in a different color. AVF is negative. This is AVF goes down. So negative, it means it's here against it, right? And where do they intersect? In this red area, this quadrant. Now, is this quadrant good or bad? Well, some of it is normal. Some of it is deviation. How do you determine that? You have to use lead two and not AVL and not lead three. Lead two. Why is that? Because lead two goes 60 degrees and the perpendicular line to it is the negative 30 that we want to know whether it's before it or after it. Okay. And here it goes 150. Okay. It's not 120. So lead two and three are not perpendicular to each other. Lead the three would come somewhere like here. Okay. Here before that. And here's the 150. So here's the thing. You check lead two. If it is positive, then it means it's here. Okay. You see, it's from negative 30 until zero. And it's normal, okay? If lead 2 is positive. If lead 2 was negative, then it means it's here in this dotted area, okay? And that's it. That's it about the axis, okay? I don't know why a lot of people get confused with it. You can even calculate the axis if you didn't have leads, uh, if you didn't have AVF. If you only have, let's say, 1, 2, and 3, okay? 1, two and three. I'll give you an example of it. Okay. Let's say lead one is positive. Lead two is, uh, let's make it positive and lead three is positive. Okay. Now we know this is normal axis, but how do we prove it? Or actually maybe let's just make this one negative. It's fine. Let's make it a bit difficult. So one is positive. Let's just draw. So this is lead one and it's positive. So we first draw a perpendicular line and it's in here. That's it. Then, so this is in pencil. This is going to be in black. Lead two goes here, right? This is lead two, 60 degrees. Then the perpendicular line to it is what? Negative 30. And here it is 150. Negative, it means it's opposite to it. And already, so far, you have known that it has to be somewhere in this uh, red area, okay? Then it's here. You can stop there and say it's from negative 30 to negative 90. Okay, you can stop it. But even if you use lead 3, lead 3, I'll make it in, in here, this purple color. Lead 3 is here. And we know it's 120. So the perpendicular line is here, 30, because 120 minus 90, that's 30. And here it's 210, or you can, because here you have to go in negatives, okay? It's like one negative 150. So it's here opposite to it. But it doesn't matter, we already established it from these, the first two, okay? So you can still calculate the axis, even if you don't have AVF, okay? That's it. Rate, rhythm, axis. Be careful with the rhythm, okay? I know it's, it's always tricky and the examiner doesn't like what he hears. So rhythm, rhythm on the wall. Why do you screw with us all? Uh, rate, rhythm, axis. So P wave. Now, as we said, P wave represents the depolarization of the atria, okay? And when we check for it, we analyze it in three parts, duration, 
amplitude and morphology okay now duration I memorize the P wave like this it goes three small boxes here okay in duration and up it goes two and a half milli small boxes also or you can say millimeter one millimeter is one small box okay so three by two and a half and that's it you can make the three if you multiply it by four twelve so it's zero point twelve but I just know it like three two and a half there we go these two if the amplitude for example increases then you might have a hypertrophy okay a right-sided hypertrophy if you have a uh, uh, increase in duration then you might have hypertrophy in the left side because usually the right side depolarizes first this one is uh, faster and this one occurs later okay so if this one is hypertrophied here then it will show itself more okay we talked about these and hypertrophy morphology the normal P wave morphology should go like this it should be positive in all leads okay and biphasic in V1 and negative in AVR and also V1 it's like you don't have to know this one that much but it's negative in, in V1 now why is it like this so the P wave as we said if this is right atria left atria mm -hmm. and the SA node is here okay on the top so it goes from SA node to AV node this is the P wave that we know but it's not just one wave it actually has two components a part that goes okay a part that goes like this okay from SA node to AV node like this this is the right atria and you have a part for the left atria now the left atria is gonna depolarize like this okay because it's gonna come from SA node all the way to the left atria so you have two components like these okay one goes like this one goes like this now for all leads for example lead 2 it will see so lead 2 will see this as positive because they kind of go in the same direction and if you take the second component it goes like this it's also with it and it will also look positive okay so since they're both positive they're gonna be seen for example in lead 2 as one uh, wave only but here's the special thing about v1 v1 goes like this okay in this plane in this horizontal plane so in this plane if this one goes like this then you see the angle between them it's a right uh, it's an acute angle okay so it's gonna be positive the first part is positive but the second part that goes all the way there you see the angle it's more than 90 so it will be seen as a negative that's why you see a positive wave then a negative wave the first one represents the right atrium and the left one represents the left first one right second one left okay that's why if you have what they call Morris index meaning a widening of the second part of it then it means you have a left atrial hypertrophy okay and of course if AVR goes all the way there all the way up and all the waves go like this or this doesn't matter first wave or second wave all of them are opposite to AVR then uh, you will see it as a negative wave okay oh sorry I wrote here V1 no I, I meant the T wave okay so it's negative in AVR okay that's the normal sorry forget about this it's not V1 we said V1 is here so we have these three criteria okay for the P wave morphology now after morphology after P wave actually that's it we're done with it we have the PR interval now remember we said here it goes to three this is how I memorize it the PR it can be three that's the minimum of it okay so the the three we said is a 12 okay zero point 12 that's the same as the 3 and then I just use this 2 again okay so it's 12 to 20 I just know 2 2 okay 2 2 2 
So from 12 to 20. Okay, this is 12 to 20 seconds. As we said, if it's prolonged, it might tell you there's a block. And if it's shortened, it might tell you that something is bypassing the AV node. It's going around it and it's not stopping as it should at the AV node, something like Wolf Parkinson White. PR, then QRS. QRS, as we said, okay, let's write it in duration, amplitude, and morpho. The duration, remember here we stopped at 20? Well, here just make it half. So it's going to be 10. So it should be less than 10, okay? Less than 10 seconds. That's it. Amplitude, well, we check the amplitude mostly in V5, V6. The leads that mostly go with here. This, you see this is going like this. This is V6. So we check for the R wave amplitude. We don't check for the S. We check for the R wave amplitude in V6 or V5, the ones that mostly go with it. Because there it shows you the strongest R wave in a normal heart. So amplitude should be amplitude should be less than five big boxes or you can call it 25 millimeters if you're using small boxes okay if it's more meaning the r wave is too strong meaning this pull this one is really too strong so it might tell you there's a hypertrophy a left ventricular hypertrophy okay and the morphology well Actually, for morphology, there isn't a normal morphology. We just, you don't have to say anything for the normal one. Just has to be not abnormal. So you only mention if you have abnormal morphologies. And we talked about these in different diseases. For example, if you have a delta wave, that's something abnormal, a delta wave in Wolf Parkinson White. Or if you have a slurred, a slurred S wave, or for example, if you have like the M complex, so these ones are all abnormal. You don't have to say a normal thing, okay? Or a QS. But what you can mention, if you want, is the R wave progression. R wave progression, okay? Now, what's R wave progression? The R wave is here, okay? This is my R wave, the left ventricular depolarization. Now in V1, be careful that if this is the septum, V1 is put here, okay? And V2 is here. V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, all of them are put on the left side. So they see the activity of the left ventricle, like here, they are on the left side. And V1 is the only one that is looking at the right side, okay? So if we said this is the R wave and V1 is there, so V1 will see the R wave as a negative wave. Then comes V2. Still, there's a wide angle, so it's still negative. But in V3, it might be biphasic, or in V4. And in V5 and 6, we said you can see the highest amplitude for the R wave, that is a positive wave, okay? So there's a transition, it's not the R wave moving, it's actually the leads are changing their perspective of the R wave from it being negative all the way to being very, very positive. So this transition from being very negative to very positive usually occurs in V3, V4. This is normal. For example, you might have a delayed R wave progression if you have a right-sided hypertrophy. So you will see, of course, with it there's right axis deviation and other stuff, but you will see the R wave progression changing in, from being negative to positive maybe in V5 or even in V6, meaning even in V5 or V4, it will still be negative because there's a pull here on this side. Okay, so it will see the, the R wave not very positive, okay, in V4, V5. This is R wave delay, R wave progression. You mostly say, talk about it when you have a hypertrophy, right-sided hypertrophy. That's it, okay? Uh, so QRS, then, ST. Now, the thing about ST is usually, of course, we say it should be isoelectric. 
but we can accept plus minus one millimeter. This is acceptable. If it's more, then you either have elevation or depression. Okay, now the elevation and depression, both of them, they might come as secondary changes. Secondary STT changes, you know, as in anything that causes abnormal QRS, okay, abnormal depolarization will cause abnormal repolarization and will change the ST and the T, okay? Or it could be primary changes, primary changes. Now, the primary changes, me, these mean that you don't have anything else on the ECG except the ST being depressed or elevated. So it's not associated with another disease. It is by itself the disease, okay, the problem. So what are the primary changes? Usually these only go with ischemia, okay? And that's it. So if you have a primary change of elevation, then this is called STEMI, okay? It's acute myocardial infarction. It's acute infarction. But if it's depression, then this is a chronic ischemia. Or sometimes they call it subendocardial. Subendocardial. I explain about these in the MI, in the myocardial infarction video about the subendocardial, okay? And that's it. This is about the ST. Now the T wave. T wave, as it is a wave, okay? We should analyze it in duration, amplitude, and morphology. Now, duration, it doesn't have a duration by itself, but there's a QT duration, okay? So the duration is going to be put in QT. What's left? Amplitude and morpho. Amplitude and morpho. Normal morphology is that it should be concordant to R wave. Okay, so wherever R wave is positive, it should be positive, and wherever it's negative, should be negative, meaning it should be negative, negative in AVR and V1. Okay, here I wanted to write V1, okay? But in the other Vs, V2, 3, 4, 5, all is positive, okay? Amplitude, as we know, it should be less than two-thirds, two-thirds of QRS. Okay, and where do we check for this one? We should check for it in V5, V6. Because come on guys, it's not fair to check for the T wave amplitude when the R wave isn't, or the QRS isn't at its best. If you're gonna compare it to QRS, compare it where it's strong. So in V5, V6. Okay, if you have, for example, a very high amplitude of the T wave, then this has few problems. Maybe you have an early ischemia, you know, in the early phases of infarction, the T wave becomes very peaked or hyperacute, okay? Or, for example, if you have hyperkalemia, a lot of potassium, then it will rush out when it goes in repolarization, and this will cause a very peaked T wave also. These are some of the examples. There are others like increased intracranial pressure or what do they call it um, in Wellens syndrome. But anyways, uh, so these are some problems with the T wave, okay? And this thing about concordant, yes, I wanted to say it here. Why is the T wave or why should it always be concordant? So if we say this is the right and this is the left ventricles, okay? This is the thickness of the left ventricle. As we know, this is endocardium, this is epicardium. And the depolarization wave goes from endo to epi. Okay, that's the R wave. And as it goes like this, what happens in it in the action potential? If you remember, the action potential had something like this, okay? And this was the depolarization, this in blue. What happens in it? Sodium comes in. Then you have the plateau. In the plateau, what happens? Calcium goes in 
at the same time potassium is going out okay so there's a balance between the k out a positive going out and a positive going in okay so what is this we said this is depolarization what is depolarization wave on uh, on the ecg it's the qrs q for septal r for left s for posterior basal and the potassium that goes out that's repolarization so this is the t wave okay i'll just leave it t what's between them is something like a silence right a segment this is your st segment okay so it goes like this now back to this polarization wave goes through the myocardium sodium is flowing in so it makes the cell positive and this one positive then this one positive so it's like spreading positivity this way so this is going to be a positive if this is a vector this one this is going to be its positive side and this is going to be its negative side and what happens if you have the t wave t wave as we know goes opposite right this is the t wave from epi to endo and what happens in it potassium goes out potassium goes out from the cell and it becomes negative then from here negative then from here negative so it is as if t wave is spreading negativity to this side so this is negative and this is by default positive so you see the r and the t always have positive sides at the same at the same direction because they have opposite directions with opposite charges so opposite of opposite is always the same okay so that's why the T wave is always concordant, meaning if the R wave, if there's a lead here, okay, I'll, yeah, if there's a lead here, then it will see the R wave as a positive wave, then the T wave also as a positive wave. If there's a lead here, let's make it in pink, okay? If there's a lead, let's say here, then it will see the R wave as a negative and the T wave as a negative, okay? It will see the negative parts. So this is it, okay? This is why it should always be concordant. Last thing is QT. Now QT refers to the time of the QRS, QRS time plus T time. So all the time that the ventricles are depolarizing then repolarizing, okay? If this time is too long, meaning that the ventricles are working too much and they will get exhausted. If they are too short, then they're not working enough and we also need to fix it. Both of them are problematic. Uh, but QT needs to be corrected. For example, we know that the normal duration of this is something uh, from 0.35 to 44, but it differs between males and females. So 0.35 to 0.44 seconds, okay? Let's say, let's take something here like between us so this is like a third of a second a third okay so if you have here a second then you must have a qrs and here this is the only ventricular time okay this is the time that the ventricles work and here is rest or they're not working okay and here maybe here and here rest. So only a third it works and two thirds it's resting. Okay? But what if this whole thing is like compressed? If you have tachycardia, then each beat, each cycle takes less time. Then this also has to shorten. So it sh should always be taken. So if I make it maybe like this, then this as ventricular time, this is gonna be okay. All right, guys, even if it's less than 0 0.35, okay? So when it's like this, that's why when you have tacky or bready, so you should do QTC, meaning the corrected QT time. And for this, you can use Bazitz or Fredericia, our university professor prefers Fredericia, which is the QT time, whatever is obvious to you, you calculate it, in seconds, okay, QT over the cubic root of RR. 
Now, what is this? The QT is, you know, we said whatever you, how, how much you measure it, you just write a number here in seconds, okay? Be careful in seconds, not milliseconds. The RR is basically 60 over the heart rate. Remember when we said here you need to calculate here, if you do this is the RR, okay? So if these are RR, Uh, we use the 300, okay, which is one minute, okay, which is 60 seconds. This is the same, 60 seconds, one minute, this, over the RR, okay, the number of boxes, big boxes is RR. So 60 over RR gives us the heart rate. But if you want the RR, you can just do 60 over rate, over heart rate. So the RR is 60 over heart rate, okay? Under cubic root and this 60 is just 60 because this is 60 seconds because here we're using seconds so be careful and heart rate you write it whatever it is and then the number that you get you compare it to the to our 35 to 44 okay and this is it okay uh, these are the basics I hope I, I covered everything uh, if you have any questions or anything that you would like me to do next, let me know about it. And uh, good luck. Okay. Bye.